I used to have a friend whose job was to sell campers and RVs. And one time he was telling us about one of the problems that he has in selling campers and RVs is that they have a competitor about, they had a competitor, same road, same interstate, but about 10 miles down the road, who would undercut their price like significantly. Like, hey, we'll sell you the same camper for way cheaper than the other guys. But the problem is, then when they would sit down with them to sign the papers, the person would look down and be like, wait, this is not the price that you told me. And they would be like, well, you want wheels on your camper, don't you? Like, we got to put wheels, you know? And they'd be like, well, but, but the price is still, well, but you, you do want a battery, you know, you do want holding tanks. And so they would, they would sell the idea of, hey, come here and buy this camper for us way cheaper than the other guys. Then you sit down, and the cost of it is totally different. He, he told us that was one of their big problems. They just couldn't go to the same shows. But ultimately, people caught on to what they were doing and would, would start coming to his place. But I was thinking of that story this week because just like a buyer going into this camper RV store and not really knowing what the price is and then sitting down and going, do I have the money for this? Can I do this? I think sometimes when we go through the Christian life, we, we, some, we think, oh, okay, this is, gonna be, this is, this is what it's going to be. But we may not actually really know what the cost is. We, have, we, we think, oh, this is what this, the cost of discipleship and following Jesus is going to be. But I think sometimes we've not actually sat down and thought through and, note, and paid attention. To Jesus, what do you say the cost of discipleship is. I don't think Jesus is like the, the, the dealer that doesn't tell the price. I think, but I think sometimes we can be a buyer that's not been paying attention. Maybe you can think of people that you've been to church with, whether it's at this church or another church you grew up in. And you're like, oh, they were so excited. But somewhere along the line, the cost of discipleship became too high and it was too high for them. Maybe it's not just somebody that sat on the pew. Maybe it was a loved one, a parent, a grandparent, a child, a grandchild. At one point, man, they were so excited about following Jesus and going to VBS and youth group and doing all of those things. But somewhere along the line, the cost became too high and they fell away. Today, we're going to be looking at a passage where Jesus speaks about this specific issue. Because it's not just, hey, the cost was too much for somebody else, but Jesus, what's the cost for me? I don't want to be the one. I, you know, I don't want to be that one. I can think of a Bible study I, leader that I used to sit under. He sometimes preached in our church. Now wants nothing to do with Jesus. And it's, it's sobering and it's scary if we allow ourselves to go, wait, what's the cost of discipleship? And am I willing to pay that price? Go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 14. I think it was way back in January that we started this series looking at the parables of Jesus in the book of Luke. So we're, we're nearing now, I think, the, the end of this series. We're going to lump some of the parables together as, before we go into the summer. But today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. Luke... 14, starting in verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Let's pray. 
Jesus, as we open your word and hear from your word, help us to, to consider the cost of discipleship, what it means to follow you, what it's going to cost us to lay down. In Jesus' name, amen. So this, the, the introduction to this paragraph is kind of strange because sometimes it's Jesus is being criticized by the Pharisees or sometimes it's because of something that's, that's happening and then Jesus is trying to correct the people that are around him. And so this one's a little strange because it starts with large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And so then Jesus speaks this parable because he's surrounded by people that are excited. It doesn't say why they're excited, but Jesus, rather than just being like, hey, the more the merrier, this is great, this is awesome, Jesus like sees that there are large crowds, and so he, this parable is spoken to the people that are excited in the moment and following Jesus. Because as Jesus speaks about the cost of discipleship, the crisis is like, is this crowd going to follow to the end? Are they going to, they're, they're following Jesus right now, but are they going to follow all the way from beginning to end? Or are they, is the, are they going to find down the road that the cost is too high? What is the crowd going to do? And so Jesus speaks to them. In verses 25 to 28, Jesus specifically addresses, or I'm sorry, 25 to 27, Jesus speaks to this crowd and says, If anybody comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This is not an easy saying that Jesus is like, hey, let's add to the crowd by saying something easy. But he's speaking to the crowd and saying this, this word hate, which we, don't, we might have a, a lot of trouble with. But in Genesis and in Deuteronomy and then again in Matthew, we see that at the time they would sometimes use the word hate for meaning to love somebody less. So that J J uh, Jacob loved one wife more than the other. And so it would be said that he hated the wife that he loved less. Um, or the Deuteronomy speaks of something similar and, and speaks about like loving somebody more than loving somebody else. And so Jesus is saying to this crowd, if you, don't, if you try to come after me, but you don't love me more than, your father, than you love your father and your mother, if you don't love me more than you love your wife and your children, if you don't love me more than the rest of your extended family, if you don't even love me more than you love your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Then Jesus uses another harsh language. We are so used to the cross. It's, we use it in jewelry. We wear it on t-shirts. You see it everywhere. The cross is not as offensive for us, but for them, Jesus says, whoever doesn't carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Jesus is set, telling this crowd, guys, the cost to follow me is really, really high. Right now, the cost doesn't seem so high because you're surrounded by people and it seems like we're on the march and everything is going well and you're excited because people are being healed and I'm feeding 5,000 people at a time. And Jesus is like, guys, the cost of discipleship as you walk down this road, it's not always going to be easy. It doesn't always look like everybody in the crowd is excited. It doesn't always look like healing and feeding, and everything going easily. Then Jesus, so then Jesus turns and tells them the first of two parables. First, Jesus says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Jesus uses a parable just an, an example, we've seen houses that have, someone has started to build. I, I once was looking when we were shopping for a house, and I saw a house that I was like, that's an enormous house for a really good price. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with this house? Well, it, it turns out the house had been framed, but there was no siding up, there was no drywall on, there was no carpet in. This was just a, a, a mansion on a large property for a really cheap price because they halfway built it and something went wrong and they couldn't finish. We might laugh at that kind of a situation, but in this situation, Jesus is like, you're going to be shamed. And this is in a culture where shame is everything. So Jesus says, if you, if you start to do something and you don't finish, you're going to end up ashamed and ridiculed. So then Jesus tells a second parable. 
or verse 31, or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. So, and then Jesus finishes with verse 33. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. So Jesus tells this parable of uh, of a king, but this one's different. Sitting down and deciding to build a barn, sitting down to build a tower, that's something that you do for yourself. This is what I want to do. This is a scenario in which somebody else is coming to attack him, but he still has to sit down and say, what am I going to do? Jesus is using these two parables to say, some of you have thought about it and you're like, this sounds great. And some of you, I, Jesus has walked into their lives and now they have to decide, what am I going to do with Jesus? But like a king who realizes, hey, I can either fight or I can make terms of peace. But I still have to think about it. Jesus is saying, stop and think about what you're doing. Don't just walk in the crowd. Don't just sit in church. Don't just attend some Bible studies. Don't just do some stuff because it's going to end in disaster and ruin if you cannot pay the cost for what you have to do. The crisis in these parables is, will the crowd follow to the end when the cost is high? And the point that Jesus makes with, this, with these two parables is that following Jesus is going to cost all of our idols. It's going to cost all of them. Not just a one-time payment, but that for, our, for the, the cost of discipleship is going to be that we will have to, to lay down, to destroy, and to say goodbye to our idols. And Jesus is calling the crowd to, con- to count the cost to follow Jesus. He's calling you and I to count the cost to follow Jesus. And what I want to show you here is the three idols it's going to cost. For, t- for us as disciples who we sit here, we don't just point the fingers at other people and say, well, that person doesn't follow Jesus anymore. But like, will I follow Jesus to the end? Here are the three idols it's going to cost we see in this passage. First, count the cost to your loves. Count the cost to your loves. Verse 26 lays out the first cost It's going, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, remember that means does not love me more than his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Jesus uses this word, if anybody. It doesn't matter if you're a disciple. It doesn't matter if you are a, a Pharisee. It doesn't matter if you're a leader of the Jews. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. It doesn't matter who it is. But if anybody wants to come after Jesus, he's going to have to count the cost. But it's specifically the cost to the things that you love the most. He, it, it, it's an, I don't know that I would have started in this order. But Jesus uses this order that matters so much that you love your father and mother. That you love your wife and your children. That you love your extended family. Some of you, that is the, the, that is the thing that you love the most. There are some who go, well, I have a, I've always had a, a hard and difficult and painful relationship with my family. The point is not simply, well, if you, if you don't love your family, then you're, you're okay. It's that anything that you love more than Jesus is going to have to be laid down turned away from and said goodbye to. The, the, the cost of discipleship is that you're going to have to love Jesus more than anybody else. I'm reminded of at the end of the book of John when Jesus turns to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me more? Because that, that's ultimately the, the, call, the question of discipleship is do, do I love Jesus more? Do I love Jesus more than I used to? Do I love Jesus more than my job? Do I love Jesus more than my reputation? Do I love Jesus more than my comfort? Do I love Jesus more than my, the sins that I, that I have held on to? Do I love Jesus more than anything? That is the question for a disciple. Is do you love me more? Earlier in the service, Becky read from Exodus. The beginning of the Ten Commandments is that we shall have no other gods before the Lord. And Jesus is echoing that here. The heart of discipleship is that we love God more than anything else. Tim Keller, in his book, The Reason for God, makes this, this comment. We usually begin the journey towards God thinking, what do I have to do to get this or that from Him? But eventually we have to begin thinking, what do I have to do to get Him? 
That's the question of discipleship. I'm going to read it again. We usually begin the journey toward God thinking, what do I have to do to get this or that from him? Maybe it's heaven. Maybe it's eternal life. Maybe it's a better life, less pain. But eventually, we have to begin thinking, what do I have to do to get him? That is the question of discipleship. Jesus is confronting the crowd here with this question. Do you love me more than anything else? And so those of us sitting here today are, are called by Jesus in this, these parables to count the cost. Say, there can be nobody else in my life that I love like Jesus. There, I can't even love myself like I love Jesus if I want to be a disciple. So we look at our lives and go, Jesus, where do I spend my time? Where do I, where do, where do I get angry when something violates that? What is it that I love so much that I will spend my time and my energy and my emotions and I'll put my whole self into? Jesus, you've called, you've called me to lay down anything that I love more than you. I count the cost to the idol of what I love. Second cost that we see in this passage. Count the cost to the idol of your desire. Notice in verse 27. Jesus says, And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. This, this could mean literally, if you don't literally carry a cross. Jesus is preparing his followers to say, You will or may have to be martyred. You may have to physically die to follow me. Jesus could be preparing them literally. It also could be a metaphor where Jesus is saying, it's going to feel like death. You're going to have to lay down your desires and take up your cross and follow me, even when it feels like death. You see, Satan comes to us and says, you can follow Jesus and feel good. You can follow Jesus and still do those things that you wanted to do on the side. Jesus says, no, if you're going to follow me, it's going to feel like death. You're going to have to lay down your life. You're going to have to pick up your cross. You're going to have to follow me even when it means you say no to the things that you wanted, the things that you dreamed about, all of those deepest desires of your heart because Jesus is not going to compete and he's not going to play second fiddle to anything else. Jesus is very, very, very clear that, that I'm not going to compete with any other desire in your life if you're going to be my disciple. Ultimately, it can be easy for us, and I'll confess I even did it yesterday, to, to look at other people and go, look at what a disaster they're making of their life. Like, what kind of rebellion against God are they living in with some specific sin? But Jesus doesn't let us do that. Because Jesus says the cost of discipleship is not will you stop murdering or not? Will you stop stealing or not? Will you leave off sexual sin or not? Will you stop this? Jesus says, will you die to the things that you wanted or not? That's the question for a disciple. Will you count the cost to the idol of your desire? Milton Vinson in his book, A Gospel Primer for Christians, speaks about this reality of what is it what does it mean to die? And how does the gospel empower that and change that? And he says, when my flesh yearns to do some prohibited thing, I must die. When called to do something I don't want to do, I must die. When I wish to be selfish and serve no one, I must die. When, my, when shattered by hardships that I despise, I must die. When wanting to cling to wrongs done to me, I must die. When enticed by allurements of the world, I must die. When wishing to keep my besetting sins secret, I must die. When wants that are borderline needs are left unmet, I must die. When dreams that are good seem shoved aside, I must die. Jesus is leaving no wiggle room. and saying there can be no idol of, well, I want this. Jesus looks at the crowd and I don't think he looks at them with disgust or with disdain because we know that he looks at the crowd with compassion. And so he's looking at the crowd with compassion and saying, if you're going to follow me, all of your idols will have to die. But notice one detail in this, this section right here. In, in verse uh, 20, when Jesus speaks about the king, notice one detail about it. In verse 31, Jesus uh, says, oh, suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider? Jesus is really specific. 
He's like, the cost of discipleship means don't rush into it. Don't do it in an emotional whim. Sit down and think about it. And so you and I are called to sit down and think about the cost of discipleship is going to mean that someday there will be a desire out there that I will have to say, no, I love Jesus. I want this desperately. I I desperately want revenge. I desperately want... I desperately want them to hurt the way that I hurt, but I'm going to have to die and let Jesus do what He's going to do. Someday there's going to come a time where it's going to feel like, oh, but this is going to feel, this is going to be true to me to do what I want to do. And we're going to have to sit down and count the cost and say, one day there will become days, many days, where I have to say no. Because the idol of my desire will have to die. The third idol that we see in this passage, you see it in verse 33, is count the cost to the idol of your authority. Look at the verse 33. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Your translation might say, who do not renounce everything. Maybe your translation says, say goodbye. It's this way of like of literally turning and waving and saying, okay, that's gone. Jesus is is saying, one day you're going to have to say farewell, goodbye, it's going to be gone. Everything that belongs to me, I think he's specifically speaking of authority. That, oh, these are my things, I get to decide where they go, what they do, how I spend them. Jesus is saying that the cost of discipleship is that one day my authority will die and I will have to say goodbye to it and to say somebody else is the leader. Maybe not even just one day, every day, that we will have to make this call that everything I have is not mine. And I will say goodbye to it. There is a temptation in the Christian life to say, I follow Jesus and yet I'm still in control. I follow Jesus and yet I still know what I want to do and where I want to go and how I want my days to be spent and how I want my money to be spent and how I want my family to live. But Jesus is saying the cost of the disciple is going to be to say goodbye to everything that you have because it's idolatry. And Jesus is going to have to be the one to call the shots. Jesus is going to be, have to be the one to call the shots. But notice in both parables, the ultimate result of somebody not doing that, not considering the cost and paying the cost, is that shame and disaster are ahead. I don't think Jesus is disgusted with the crowds. I think that in compassion, He's like, there is disaster and shame ahead if you don't pay this cost. If you don't consider this cost, if you don't walk down this road with me, that one day it's going to end in shame and disaster. Sometimes when I'm counseling or sharing with somebody, especially about parenting issues, I have have to remind myself, and it becomes helpful to remind the other person, that as parents, we easily demand certain things of our kids. Right? Right? We, we easily demand respect and obedience and behavior and submission and all of those different kinds of things. But one of the things that I, 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 I had to learn, and I'm, I'll say I still have to learn and still learning, but often share with other people, is that it is so easy as a parent to demand submission and respect and obedience from our kids while being unwilling to give it to God, which is the ultimate hypocr- hypocrisy. It is so easy as a parent to be uh, controlled by anger because we are not getting the respect that we deserve while ignoring the God of the universe who has said, this is actually how you're going to parent. And you're going to parent with compassion and with care and raising them in the fear and admonition of the Lord. You see, it is so easy for us to demand of other people to respect and submit and to obey God because their sins are worse than our sins while being unwilling to give it to God. And Jesus is here saying, no, actually, you don't get to do that. You you need to consider the cost that if Jesus is Lord, then you will have to say goodbye to your authority regularly. Not one time, but regularly. So this passage says, count the cost to follow Jesus. Jesus lays out three idols that it's going to cost us. The idol of our love, the idol of our desires, and the idol of our authority. But if we are honest, then who can be saved? If we are honest, if this is the cost of discipleship, that it's going to cost me everything, who can be saved? 
If following Jesus means loving him most, then what hope is there for me when I find that I love the creation and not the creator? If following Jesus means death to my desires, what hope is there for me when my effort can't kill them? If following Jesus costs you your authority over your life, what hope is there for you when you realize you haven't said goodbye to your authority? Like This passage, if we read it correctly and hear Jesus, Jesus in this, is crushing. Jesus' teaching on the cost of discipleship, I actually think, prepares us and points, us, that points out that somebody's going to have to die for my idolatry of people and of self. It shows that we are dead in our desires and sins and it becomes obvious who can pay this cost for my discipleship. This passage prepares us for Jesus because He is the one who counted the cost for you to be a disciple and then He paid it. Jesus loved God the Father and God the Spirit and then died as a lawbreaker. Jesus never gave in to the desires of the flesh, but paid the cost for it. Jesus didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself in taking the form of a servant for you. So if you're in Christ, rather than condemnation, look to Jesus who counted the cost for you. He paid it and says, follow me. You can follow and trust that the cost is paid and that the resurrection is on the other side of all of the death that God calls you to. The power of the resurrection will be at work in you and in front of you. But maybe you've never counted the cost and begun following Jesus. Maybe you've been trying to pay your own way on the road to following Jesus. The Bible says that you are still dead in your sins and need to be saved. How can that be yours today? How can it be yours today who realize the debt you owe God and the fact that you cannot pay it? The Bible tells us that Jesus, the God-man, lived the life that we should live, died the death that we should die, and was raised to life. So that all who repent of sin, that just means a changing of the mind, a turning away from myself and my own ways, and taking Jesus only to save them, will be saved. Repentance and faith. Two sides of the same coin. And it is those who make that trade with Jesus and find He has paid the cost have the guarantee that there is resurrection at the end of this discipleship road. And so if that's you today, grab me. Grab me while we sing at the end of the service. Grab me at the hallway. Let today be the day that you are clear that today I have begun following Jesus in the record of Jesus. Don't put it off. So this passage, this passage It says, following Jesus costs all of our idols and Jesus pays it. What difference does that make? What difference does that make in your life when you look at the cost of discipleship and you look at an uncertain future when there will be, there will be desires that go unmet that feel so powerful, when there are doubts that come in that feel crushing, when there are days ahead that you feel like all I feel is death. What changes when we realize that Jesus pays the cost of our discipleship. Imagine what changes in your life when you, when you realize, oh, the cost of discipleship, it's not on me today. It was on Jesus and it's been paid. Imagine what happens when you look at the future and you go, the God of the universe who gave himself, who loved me and gave himself for me, calls me to follow him after he paid the cost. Who wouldn't want to follow that kind of Jesus? Who wouldn't want to follow that kind of leader who says, follow me, I've paid it all. Imagine what, that that sounds like a confidence. Even if the situation feels like death, the guarantee that the God who says, follow me and has paid the cost is out in front and says there's resurrection coming. So if you, maybe you live alone or maybe you live with an unbelieving spouse or family member and you go, the weight of this is crushing but knowing that Jesus has paid the cost and is walking ahead of you, promising resurrection on the other side, sounds like confidence in that lonely place. What's that mean in a family? When a family is then dominated by the the reality that Jesus pays the cost for our discipleship and He still says, follow me. Imagine what changes in a church that says this is the very real cost of discipleship. And we have a glorious Lord who's paid it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you that you invite us to sit down and to consider the cost of discipleship. 
to consider that it's going to cost all of our love and all of our desires and all of our authority, and then knowing full well that this is a debt that we can never pay, you paid it. Oh, may we trust your heart as you say, follow me into the days of death that we walk through. In Jesus' name, amen.